Well, let's talk about a major global health problem. And uh, I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm saying because there's something wrong about what I'm going to tell you. Um, I want to talk to you about maternal mortality. And in the decade ahead, if nothing is done, three million women will die while giving life. That's 20 women who will die during the short talk that I'm giving to you today. The death of a new mother is one of humanity's greatest tragedies. It tears apart families, it leaves children orphaned, and it actually causes tremendous economic problems around the globe. And it really doesn't have to happen. We can and we must prevent these tragedies. Now, you might think that in the 21st century, maternal mortality would be limited to the developing world. Unfortunately, that's not right. No geography is spared. Even in the most medically advanced regions of the world, some women die while bringing forth life. In Massachusetts, where I've practiced medicine most of my life, the death of a mother around the time of uh, pregnancy or delivery is an exceedingly rare event, but it does happen. Of about 100,000 live births, 10 of them result in death. But you know, statistics really don't tell the story. And my family had its own brush with the threat of maternal mortality. On the 4th of July, seven years ago, my daughter delivered a baby in Boston one of the medical capitals of the world. It was our first grandchild, Rose, and she was born in one of Boston's great teaching hospitals. A few days later at home, my daughter developed a slight fever. Within hours, her temperature reached 104, and it was still climbing. Fortunately, the hospital staff knew immediately what to do. She was infused with intravenous antibiotics, and the postpartum uh, infection and sepsis were caught in time. But if she had been delayed just a few hours in getting to the hospital, or if she had delivered Rose in a developing nation, or even in some parts of the United States, the outcome could have been very different. The unimaginable for a parent could have happened, and our Rose might have been motherless. What causes maternal mortality? I have my list of the three major causes of it. There's uncontrolled bleeding, which happens in the hours right after labor and delivery, uh, and that's postpartum hemorrhage. There's also a type of high blood pressure called preeclampsia, and in this condition, the blood pressure builds and builds in the weeks leading up to labor and delivery, and it can damage the brain and the heart and the kidneys, and if untreated, a young mother can die. And then there are infections and other causes. But I'd like to return to my original question, which is, what's wrong with what I've been telling you? This woman, Dr. Winnie Mambasa, who works for Save the Children, taught me the answer. From her words, I began to think about these tragedies differently. And I began to realize that, as a physician, I had to broaden my perspective. Early in her career, she was working as a physician in Belgium, and she was part of a team that lost a mother during childbirth. Dr. Mubasa was devastated. Years later, she was working in Africa, and again, she was part of a team that lost a mother during childbirth. Again, Dr. Mubasa was devastated, but the team accepted the tragic outcome. Why? Because it was routine in that geography. So she taught me the real causes of maternal mortality, and they weren't, none, none of the items on her list were on my list. Her list went beyond the medical. She listed the lack of skilled birth attendants, the lack of basic medicines and equipment. 
there are complex cultural factors. For instance, the belief that childbirth should be completely natural. We know that one out of three pregnancies is unintended, or it occurs in a, a girl who's forced to marry at a young age. So the availability of family planning and contraception, we estimate, might decrease maternal mortality by as much as 30%. Getting medical assistance might require the permission of a reluctant husband or a reluctant mother-in-law who somehow believes that it's unnecessary or embarrassing for the family or even dangerous. Infrastructure is non-existent in some parts of the world. In some villages, even if there's a car to get you to the clinic, the family has to pay for the gas up front, a fee that's too large for many families. And here's a picture of something that passes for an ambulance in some parts of the world. This donkey cart happened not to be available because the donkey died. Or baskets are used as ambulances and men carry a woman running along the trails to get to the clinic. So I learned from the words of Dr. Mombasa that what we see as a health problem is really a symptom. It's a symptom of a much more complex convergence of societal, economic, and cultural factors. And it resists a simple remedy. Uh, in fact, it may even be misleading, strictly speaking, to call these health problems. Now, I, I'm reminded of a saying that maybe some of you know, which is that war is too important to be left to the generals. Well, I've come to the conclusion that maternal health and big global health problems like it um, are too important and too complex to be left to just the doctors and the scientists and the healthcare companies. What we need to do is to leap over the old boundaries that define a disease like that the way I originally defined it for you, and we need to open ourselves to more tools and more allies, including allies from the private sector. Has the private sector delivered? In my view, not yet. And despite spending billions of dollars and countless hours and the introduction of real scientific innovations, for the most part, we remain frustrated at achieving breakthroughs in global health. Now, why is that? I think what we're facing today is a collective failure of the imagination. We're just too entrenched in our pursuit of high-tech, sophisticated solutions as the principal measure of our success. We're kind of captivated by the brightest, shiniest objects that can emerge from our laboratories. And, and that's a big mistake, because while these advances can really truly have great impact in the world that you and I live in, uh, they may be totally impractical in the developing world. Um, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, I think the traditional measures of donation of money, donation of medicines, and the formation of these public-private partnerships, they can have great impact. And you only need to look at uh, the progress that's been in, made in AIDS to realize that. But for a big problem like maternal mortality, a global health problem, that kind of approach is just not going to get us to where we need to go. We need to think differently. We need radically different approaches. Because what Dr. Mombasa saw was simultaneous deficiencies. She saw deficiencies that converged in transportation, in energy, in education, sanitation, water. They all conspired to create something that we register as a health problem. So here's the good news. If we can reimagine this kind of problem, as coming out of an ecosystem, then we can start to reimagine the solutions to the problem. And we can see that many companies across many sectors of private industry are necessary to, to solve this problem and can work together. And that's the other thing. We need a new level 
of collaboration, a much higher level of collaboration, uh, one that not only includes the healthcare companies for sure, but goes well beyond them to involve other parts of industry. So, you know, armed with this new insight, what can we do? Well, for sure, there's room for scientific advances. But as I've said, a problem like maternal mortality is as complicated as hunger and clean water. It's multidimensional, it's geographically diverse, and it resists a one-step solution. You know, in my view, maternal mortality is even more complex than AIDS. And there, the problem has been to get multiple medicines to remote parts of the world to train healthcare workers and to educate patients. So we really have to get to focusing on the basics. We have to create access to clinics. The clinics need to be staffed by trained birth care attendants, and they need to have supplies like medicines, some of which were discovered decades ago, and they need to have blood for transfusions. Those simple and obvious things would go a long way. Our company is realizing and recognizing that we have a role to play, too, and we see three ways that we can contribute. One, we can accelerate access. We can make available things like contraception. Two, we can innovate. For example, we can take a proven medicine, a proven therapy, and reformulate it so that it no longer needs refrigeration, which is a scarce commodity in places like Africa. And then we can advocate. And, and we've, again, learned from the example of AIDS that public awareness can really wind up shaping global policy. Well, I think probably by now, a number of you are asking, well, what's in it for a pharmaceutical company? And I can answer that in two words, education and participation. We're going to learn from mothers, and we're going to learn from participating in this. And that's going to help us reach the 80% of the world's population that we don't currently reach. I come from a company that calls itself a global pharmaceutical company, but we only reach 20% of the world's population. And the other reason to do it is that we really believe that this is part of our mission. Um, there's a, a well-known quote from the son of the founder of our company, George W. Merck, and he said this 60 years ago. He said, how can we bring the best of medicine to each and every person? We will fall into gross error with fatal consequence unless we find the answer, how to get the best of all medicine to all the people. He was right. We need to get to each and every person. If other companies use that guiding principle, if they ask themselves, who's the customer, or who's the client, or who needs our help, the answer would be it's not just the patient in the exam room, it's everyone. So let me close with a final observation for you. And, and that is that companies develop and grow by doing what they do best and applying it to a new challenge. And problems like maternal health and global health problems represent a compelling opportunity to develop and grow while doing good. We can't save mothers all by ourselves. We need the resources, we need the energy, we need the creativity of many different institutions and governments and the private sector to make this vision a reality. What's the vision? Well, I need only see my healthy daughter holding my healthy granddaughter to realize that's the vision, that we can do the same for millions of women and their children. We can accomplish this. What greater return on innovation could there be than to save a mother and launch a new human life? Thank you.